in uh, therapy, uh, things like that. And this is more from a design up uh, approach that I've been doing with several departments uh, where we've been designing games from scratch and building from their learning outcomes, actual games that are deployed in the classroom. Um, and we're going to be focusing a bit on one that I've been working at the moment, which is one of the bigger projects we're doing, which is a worker placement game within policing. Uh, going through a few things, introductions and things like that. This is what we're going through. Uh, hopefully, uh, apologies in the room. I will drop all the links in the chat as I go, um, but they are available to everybody uh, to click as we go. Um, introductions. My name is Richard Hind. I am one of the senior learning technologists at the University of Chester in the Centre for Academic Innovation and Development, known as CADE. Um, if you do want to get in touch with me after this, um, there is my Twitter X handle, uh, LinkedIn and my email at work. Uh, they will be on the last slide as well. So if you don't get them now, you can grab them then as well. Um, and what I wanted to do is focus on this talk is that I'm very aware when I attend events like this is that all of us come from uh, a background uh, of really enjoying games. Uh, and uh, we know what they are, we know the nuances. Um, uh, likelihood is all of us scoff at the uh, mention of Monopoly and things like that. Um, however, in my day to day life as a uh, learning, senior learning technologist, speaking to lecturers and trying to pitch game based learning, a lot of time that is their level of understanding. If I say, oh, we can make a game for the classroom, is they instantly think Monopoly or Cluedo or even worse, snakes and ladders and things like that. Um, and trying to get lecturers to think in that way. So whenever I approach uh, any lecturers about the discussions about this, it's really in my mind is how do I get non-gamers to think like gamers? And that is always the first hurdle that I come across. Uh, and this first started for me uh, working with um, social work. Um, if any of you are familiar with this solo RPG, I'm going to drop it. This is my first experience of it. I've done many more after this. But I'm going to drop it in the chat. Um, but if you're not familiar, it is the uh, solo RPG called The Wretched, which is about yourself being a uh, sole survivor on a um, spaceship. Uh, and you have to um, use a deck of cards, which all each um, theme has. Uh, each deck sort of suit in the deck has different prompts with each one. So 13 prompts in each one of the suits, one being about the ship, one being about you. Um, and I remember when I first played this, I sat down one evening and I don't know how long it had gone past, but by the end of it, I had roughly the plot of a novella in front of me. And I was just looking at this thinking there is there's something here for the classroom. There's something that can be done for a, a multitude of different um subject areas and departments and my first thought was well it's like placements isn't it you're being thrown these scenarios during a placement and i made a list of everywhere that did placements at our university chester uh, and uh, i approached the uh, social work department with a rough draft of what i considered using the wretched as a template and how we could do this um we um trialed it with students and staff alike um, it started off that um, we ran it as a class. We ran it with a whole cohort to start with. It There's about 30 students in the class. I, I will admit now that I um, prepped the deck and put in the best cards in order to get the most conversation to start while we were demoing it. Um, and what I imagined would be a quick demo to the students led to them having nearly a 20 minute conversation about one card that came out with one prompt. So I thought, OK, there's something here. I gave out the instructions to the group. Uh, I gave each uh, a deck of cards and within the five groups they each had five home visits that they visited and came back with a little presentation about what they did. And without even my prompting, my next thing I was going to ask is if you want to take this home, you can. Several students put their hands up and went, can I take this home? I want to I want another go at this. So as my first dipping my toe into game based learning, that's where we started. Um, and we've moved through several different uh, departments and different subject areas since, um, which I will go into later on. Um, but the one we're talking about today was the policing because that is the biggest one we've done so far today. And what I want to focus on next is those initial discussions that we have, because a lot of people when I go, oh, we we are doing game based learning. It is based around a um, 
uh, a board game or a card game, they instantly, like we say, go over uh, these things. So I generally don't use a lot of game terminology, at least early on. I don't mention d and I don't mention TTRPG. Um, the way I pitched um, the um, the wretched sort of esque thing to social work was a case study generator is what I used all the time as my language, uh, and that got them in because it's both a, a lecturer's tool in that they can use it to generate case studies for discussion, and the students can also use it uh, as a learning tool as well. Uh, but whenever I approach a new department or get someone who is interested in approaching in game based learning, I go through these things first is what is the, I get them to explain and give me an elevator pitch about what their module is about. And then I go, what do you do now already? So uh, in the case of what we're doing with this one uh, it is a, um, a policing module in which they talk about decision making and leadership. And one of the things they want to use is because the uh, teaching school is in Warrington, near the Warrington Wolf Stadium, is about the decision and leadership that is involved in pl deploying police and managing police at a sports event. Now, at the moment, it's very much just we have discussions about it um, and it's very much just sort of asking questions and returning. It's very low on Bloom's taxonomy. There's no real analysis of the situation that's going in and things like that. Um, however, there is a lot there that we can go with. Um, and one of the things that I always do is get them to explain to me what they do now, what outcomes do they want from the students? And then we go and we look at one of my favorite things at the moment, which is uh, this gamification taxonomy, which uh, I will link to uh, in the next slide, uh, which I have actually also put together in a slightly more readable uh, format for you all here, um, which um, the paper is fantastic. They have looked at a lot of other papers and then brought them all together in this big conglomeration of like breaking everyone down into these five different areas of gamification terms and terminology and how you can group things. Now what I like to do and since I'm doing a lot of game-based learning through work and I design games in my own time I've got two games on the go is that I end up looking at sort of standard things in my life and thinking what where on this wheel does this do and the other day i found myself doing the shopping and i was in tesco's and i was like how would i do this this is an economic based imposed choice uh situation where there's social pressure that i don't forget things so my other half doesn't get annoyed with me uh and, and things like that and thinking about these things and applying these uh, terminologies to things in real life which is what we do with the lecturers and get them to think about what they teach and their placements and the subject matter they're teaching through this lens. So with the lecturers that we talk to, as I say to them, like, tell me what is the outcomes and what you want to do. So this is a rough description of what uh, the lecturer that um, I work with said, that students need to work as a team to police crowd control at sporting event and how to deploy their officers and discuss and write what they're doing so they, they can pitch at the end what they're doing. Now, I went away and sat and thought about it, several different ideas. And to me, this is how the game would be described if this was a game that you could buy on the shelf in saying that it's a cooperative worker placement game. So the police officers that you deploy are the worker placements. They're the meeples in this environment. Uh, you've got economic constraints in terms of how many meeples you can do. Uh, it's a shock to me how little police are at a sporting event, especially smaller ones and mid tier ones. You don't realize how little police are there. The time pressure element of the actual time for the sporting event, uh, as it's Warrington Wolves, it's a rugby game, it's 80 minutes. Um, so you can set that time pressure and you can do it as a multiple or a subtraction of that amount of time. Uh, and then you measure through stats. Now we have in this game a control stat, which uh, I'll at uh, several slides and I'll talk about where my influence comes through from there. And then we also have a creation of a narrative, which is their presentation of the event after the fact and justification of their decisions and what they did. Um, and what works well in this is it is both a cooperative uh, game in that the students as a group work together, but there is the social pressure is one of them is the match commander. So they have to actually be the final say if the if there are people arguing over decision, they get the final say. So there is the social pressure that they the, the book stops with them as well for the decisions that they make. So here we are highlighted all the different areas on that gamification taxonomy that we hit. 
uh, quite a lot. I'm not saying you have to hit all of these whilst you're making your games. It can be higher or lower. Um, this game that we've designed is quite modular, so you can actually remove and add elements so you can uh, ramp your students' experience up to this. And I'll explain how we did that as well and how we ramp them up to the final um, version of the game that they can play. And here is a breakdown of the different areas where we hit as well. So as I was saying, you've got the social aspect in the, the cooperative nature of it, um, the social pressure of the match commander having the final say, um, and they have to learn how to cooperate with each other and actually discuss the points that they're doing. The ecological and the economic points on this is the um, the amount of police that you start the game with, which can vary on different factors that come out with the cards. Um, and how they're deployed. Um, that was a big surprise for me, um, not talking about massive football games and uh, things like that, but Warrington Wolves, uh, when they said they maybe have between 10 and 15 police, maybe, which really surprised me. I thought there'd be more than that. So when you think about it, if you are the match commander and you have that many police and you've got so many spinning plates and different areas that you have to police, how do you effectively deploy those? and make sure that you're not leaving areas uncovered and justifying why, which was a really interesting uh, conversation to have. Um, the control level, which is the performance, which is the stat, which is the metric for whether how you're doing in the game, and it will actually dictate whether you failed. Um, that is something that um, is really interesting to build into this scenario, this failure based learning that students can play this game over and over again and they may absolutely make all the wrong decisions and fail. But as long as they can write why in the narrative, this is why it failed and why we would do it differently in the future. It really helps uh, if students can fail 100 times in these simulated environments, it gives them that armor when they go out into the placements in real world to know that they've made these decisions in some respects further on as well. The other thing that we also uh, discuss a lot with lecturers when we're trying to design games with them is what are the static and dynamic elements of the game? Uh, what is something that is absolutely pivotal and maybe the things that everything else orbits around uh, and what things can and cannot change? So um, in this case, the stadium is the static element. There's always the same thing, the same um, north, south, east and west stands outside the stadium is an element. They all remain the same, but the things that can change are the amount of officers that are available to you at that match and the events that occur during that match as well. So there's a lot of things that can change and give that randomised element to it. But there is always the touchstone of the stadium is always the same. Uh, and one of the things that we are doing, um, hopefully in the future, it's part of the project, is that we will be attending Warrington Wolves, uh, both when there is a match and when there isn't, and using um, 360 video cameras to film at all different points of the um, stadium during a match. So there will be one put in the middle uh, before the match starts. Uh, there will be ones at every different state, a sort of entryway and exit way. Uh, and our students have access to um, what we call the VR cave. It's like a, an immersive suite. If you have one at your institution, it's where you have the projected screens on all sides. Um, so students will be will go into that um, uh, immersive suite beforehand, be able to immerse themselves in the situation, move around the stadium and look at these different places, make notes about it before they actually happen. So. For example, oh, I didn't realise the West uh, stand is actually a standing only stand. So if something occurs there, it will impact slightly differently to somewhere else and things like that. Um, and then once they've done that immersive suite, they will be then moved on to the game itself as well. So we move on to the design process, uh, which is how we actually make this game with the uh, lecturers and uh, how we work with them. Um, I've this will be the fifth or no, be the sixth, sorry, the sixth version of a game based learning project from beginning to end that we are working with lecturers. And uh, I've kind of got it down to this process at the moment, uh, which works really well, um, both for myself as the creator of part of the game and the lecturers themselves that are involved as well. Um, I always go by keep it agile and take small steps with the lecturers. Um, most of the time, many lecturers that I work with have never gamed before or it's very minimal or the games that we mentioned before that that's their 
sort of level that they are used to. So break it into small steps. I will do this, you will do that. Break it down into those manageable chunks. Um, focus on what learning outcomes and bring something back to them. Um, mock up the scenarios and, and essentially a hand of cards or a board or something to show, look, this is what I have in my mind using what you've said of your learning outcomes is what the students will see in front of them and explain it to them. Give them that little sort of walk around the product first. Um, I will show you the, the version that I've done for policing. This is what I went and said, right, this is what I thought in my head. Here you go. Um, and that went from being someone who was quite interested to exceptionally interested when they were like, oh, I get it now. It's in front of me. I can see it. Uh, and make sure that you do these um, frequent meetings with them. I, The policing one that I'm talking about now, um, apart from having paternity leave in the middle of it, is about five weeks worth of work meeting once a week. Uh, and the turnaround time of how we can quickly turn something from an idea into a prototype, which we are looking to test. Unfortunately, we were looking to test it before today. Uh, sadly, a meeting came up for the policing department, so we've had to postpone it. But um, we do have everything ready to go. It's currently on my desk to be able to test. The other option is that oh, the other part is keep it simple. Uh, start with one element of the game. Uh, in this case, the the beginning was the cards that have events that students have to react to um, we broke them down into different areas so they'll be inside the stadium things reported by the control room reported by ground level policing uh, social media and things like that we focused on one set of cards ground level policing and initially it didn't have anything to do with the board game it was this has happened at ground level what do you do it was very much a call and response kind of thing and it was very much just asking the students we've that is the first version of the game that we've generated, kept it simple. Um, we then made it modular. So every set of cards, so outside the stadium, ground level policing, control room, so the CCTV room, um, social media and other aspects like that are all designed to be added and removed to the game as you compete or complete the complexity. So taking social work, for example, one that we are on our third round of redesigns with, is that we have a set of set of four subjects, but as students get more involved, they can add other subject matter in, depending on what it is. So it has the core subject area, but say, for example, they're dealing with issues around substance abuse, there will be a set of cards that they can add and remove, depending on if that is the subject area. This makes it easier for you to design. It makes it easier for the lecturer to get their head around as well if they're not a gaming person. Um, and it also means that you can um, ramp up the learning within the classroom. You're not dropping this massive game on them. You're starting with a very small core part of the game and adding to it. Even though I'm not a big fan of it, uh, it reminds me a lot of Cards Against Humanity with a core deck and then you add decks on different subject matter after they can be added or removed depending on the subject matter at hand. Um, I also try and make sure the game is as easy to understand. I try and make sure that the entire rule set fits on the side of A4 because uh, the more complicated the lecturer wants to make the game, the harder it is to teach it and it eats into your teaching time and you lose more and more people. It reminds me a lot of Stephen Hawking's quote about his book that he was told that for every equation you include in the book, you probably halve your readership. So I always mention, like, just keep it as simple as possible. We don't want to think too far out the box. We keep it very simple. Um, it is quite casual. Um, it's a term that I would use with my friends with games that are of medium crunch is where I would say is my upper limit for games that I would design within a classroom at this point. Um, and also keeping your language for visual and text based as simple as possible. The cards need to speak for themselves about what they do, what this lecturer and the student need to do in this situation. And then finally, uh, for me to go away is when I've got my learning outcomes is to look at my own games and my gaming systems. I think I've taken a picture of my collection there. I have taken it far enough away that you can't all judge me too harshly on my games collection, um, but maybe you can pick out some good stuff there. But the games on the left are the one, the things that I have used to inspire this game that we're going to be talking about in a minute. Escape the Dark Castle and Escape the Dark Sector purely from each card has a decision and a situation. I tend to describe it as D&D light. The, the game is the, D, the is the dungeon master, is the game master. 
Uh, and the idea of this is that each card describes itself and doesn't need the lecturer to step in. It explains what, what has happened, what you need to do in the game, and then what do you need to do out of the game? And we'll show what we mean in that in a second. Dead of Winter again for that um, a discussion um, about what you need to do and making decisions. Um, Alien, Fate and the Nostromo. I don't know if anyone's played this. Uh, it's a, a, It feels like I'm, I'm, I'm doing Ravensburger a disservice, but that game for how little it costs is far, worth far more than that. It's one of my favourite games that I've played in the last few years. But that has a um, morale that um, things happen in the game that impact on the morale. And if your morale goes below a certain point, the game ends. In this policing scenario, it's not morale, it's control. Things happen in the game and you have to react. And if you don't do things or not to the level that is expected, the control of the game drops. If it drops to a certain level, you have lost control of the match and you've lost control of the crowd. Uh, and then finally, uh, Carcassam, one of the OGs. Um, this one is more about worker placement and actually you have X amount of meeples. Some of them stay on the board for the entire game. Some of them return to your hand and the different situations they can happen in. So I've talked a lot about what this is and I'm going to show it to you now. This is the first iteration. Uh, this is before graphics and our graphic design team have got hold of it. So be kind in that respect. Um, so we have um, cards that describe the teams that are visiting. The, the home team is always Warrington Wolves because it's Warrington Stadium. And we have cards for all the other teams in the league. Uh, each card has the rivals of who they're playing. So are they or are they not a rival of Warrington Wolves and will that impact and team info on them as well. And then each of the other cards of the events that happen that occur uh, have a description of where what is happening, what you have to do on the board and what would you have to think about as a police officer in that situation. So you've got two levels of interaction. What do you have to do on the board and what do you have to discuss as a team and discuss with your lecturer about what is the right thing to do? So in this case, we've got outside the stadium, the home fans are throwing projectiles at the away team's coach. So in the game, you have to deploy uh, three officers, that's three meeples, uh, to this location to ensure it is resolved. For every officer you fail to deploy, you reduce control by one. So this means that if you have, or you do not have enough meeples in this location, you only have two, you can deploy two, but you lose control by one. Um, this one also has the caveat, and this is one of the hardest cars in the game. You have to use three officers and you remove uh, one of the officers from the game completely because they have to take who they arrest away to the police station. And the card on the right, for example, has a similar situation, two officers deployed, but if it's before half time, they return to your pool of usable officers. So you can um, gain them back. So some police officers you lose in the more dramatic situations, some you gain back th things that are resolved in that time frame. This is the board that we've done. Um, please uh, ignore the fact that this is a Google map uh, screenshot that we've used as our demonstration model at this point in time. But what you can see here is all the different areas of the game. So we have the north, south, east and west stands. You'll notice that on the and outside the stadium, sorry, as well. Each one of these has a small box next to them, which is your pool of meeples. Before the game starts, when you know who you're playing and the game type and how many offices you have, the match commander and the team decide where these meeples are going to be deployed. So how many officers are going to be at the north stand, east stand? Uh, they need to have done their research that they know that actually the away front fans are in the east stand. So if they know that it's a particularly tense game, maybe they need to put more there and things like that. Um, and that's how they deploy the game. So I will go to the next slide, which gives you a little bit of an example of a, a mock up of how it would look. And this is how I pitched it to my lecture and how I thought about it. So at the moment, we've got uh, nothing happening in the West Stand. There are four officers uh, doing nothing. Um, maybe at half time, the team will decide to actually let's redeploy some of those to another area because they're not being used um, and go from there. Um, we've got people in the East End. North Stand have got no more officers. They've had to deploy three officers into that particular situation. I think I can't read it on my screen, but I think that one's where a uh, fight is kicked off in the bar and they have to uh, resolve that situation. And then down here at the bottom, we know that we've got Warrington playing Catalan Tigers. Uh, it's a league game, but it's pretty friendly. Uh, and Warrington Police uh, can spare one additional officer to the match because it's, there are no other events happening in Warrington at that time. 
So it's so a six steps for the rules. Uh, you decide you pull an opposing team card, a game type card, and the level of policing. Uh, that lets you know you decide where you deploy your police uh, and where you want to do into the different pools around the board. The first half of the game, you deploy four cards, one for every 10 minutes. Half time break, write up your notes, redeploy your pieces and reset any pieces as you wish. Repeat uh, four cards in the second half. Finish your game and write up your notes. Now, uh, as said before, a d and is a uh, world of infinite possibilities. However, currently, as we have, that is how unique with our test set each game will be. Um, so uh, it <laughs> may not be infinite, but it's getting close. Um, so that we know that adding additional events and game types and things like that can improve this and the differences that they will make in an evolving situation can help. I'm going to very quickly go through the next bits for it, which is the technology and the design part of it. So uh, if you if I don't have the time, I will uh, definitely meet up with people after this. But everything designed here is using Nandek. I don't know if we get a show of hands if people have used Nandek before for designing. An exceptionally great piece of free software for Windows, which allows you to prototype cards. And what makes it fantastic is when you design your cards, everything here is just pulling from a spreadsheet. So you can design your template in a spreadsheet, give that to a lecturer and go, I want you to design me, in this case, ground level policing, give me 50 descriptions and then the instructions and things like that. That is brought into Nandek. You just import it. A little bit of code, which if you're au okay with HTML, I think you can pick this up very quickly. And it spits out cards that are generated in printable sheets that can be sent to your print unit. I sent all of mine to the print unit yesterday, collected them. It cost me less than £10 to print an entire A2 board and nearly 150 cards for this, which are sat on my desk, all with printed backs and designs. So every card set has different ones. And these are other designs that I've done with other areas of the university. So education, this is geography, social work, and also for accessibility, you can flip your fonts out to open dyslexic in this case very quickly. It took me about 10 minutes to just adjust a few settings. And now I have an uh, open dyslexic font deck and an aerial font deck. So you can make it accessible to everybody in that sense. I'm going to skip ahead because testing hasn't happened because unfortunately it's been very busy uh, with uh, policing at the moment. But I will open to questions and say thank you for letting me talk. <laughs>